Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Warag Thung, Earthlets. Turns out Christmas miracles do happen. Uh, you're listening to a new episode of the 2080s Fullcast, and I'm your host, Malchar. We're going to start with an apology. Uh, sorry we've been away for a few months. It's been, as you can imagine, a bit of a rough year. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of work going on behind the scene, uh, various illnesses, various things moving around, uh, pressures on time and energy. So I've not been able to devote uh, as much of either to the Thrillcast as I would have liked. So I'm sorry that there's not been new episodes until now. But because it's Christmas, I thought we would do just a little episode uh, as a, a herald of what's to come with uh, going back to regular broadcasting uh, in the new year. So uh, welcome back. And I hope you enjoy this episode. This is uh, not necessarily festively themed, but uh, this episode is a tribute to Alan Grant, who we lost this year. I, it, we're losing so many of the 2080 greats, and Alan going uh, landed particularly hard just because he's such an important figure in the history of 2000 AD. Um, you know, the, you, you think about the, the the kind of original golden age of the prog, and Alan and John uh, at, at the smack there in the centre. You know, uh, um, you look at some of the issues, and they're practically writing the whole thing, and it's such great quality stuff. Um, so when he uh, when he passed away, uh, yeah, it was particularly difficult. Um, and I've, I've been wanting to do this episode um, for a little while. It's broken into two parts. Uh, the first is going to be uh, a chat that I had at New York Comic Con with Garth Ennis, uh, Dan Raspler, a former editor at DC Comics and uh, comics critic, uh, who we know from uh, the Thrill cast, Chloe Maveal. Uh, we talk about the legacy of Alan Grant and uh, it, it lovely, lovely chat with the three of them. But Garth really knocks it out of the park towards the end when he reveals the secret origin story of Alec Trench, uh, who's uh, one of those figures that, uh, yeah, if you if you know, you know. Uh, so some really uh, lovely, heartwarming stories there. And the second part is going to be uh, an interview that I conducted with Alan Grant and John Wagner back in the beginning of 2021. Now, I'd been trying to set this up for a while. Um, I got them both on Zoom. I didn't really work <laughs> very well there was a there was a time lag and if anybody made any noise and it it kind of went over you know cancelled out other people's voices so it was a very frustrating process um so it's, it wasn't it wasn't my best uh interview that i've conducted but john and alan as, as always were incredibly gracious with their, their, their time and, and energy um after afterwards uh, i i had intended to to go back and just try and get them in the room together and uh, and have a proper deep down chat where they could bounce off each other and alas it was not to be um and alan uh, passed away early this year uh i hadn't been intending to put the interview out uh but uh, with some judicious editing <laughs> um i think uh, i think actually listening to it again it's a really lovely hour of hearing the two of them just recount some of the 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 highlights of their working relationship how they got to know each other what they think about each other um and uh, what it's like to look back on that that such a one of the greatest partnerships in in in, in comics it wouldn't surprise any of you to to hear that i think it's it's the greatest uh, creative partnership in comics um so, uh, yeah, uh, two parts. We talk through Alan's legacy and then we hear from the man himself with uh, with his longtime collaborator, John Wagner. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this episode. We'll be back uh, in the new year 
with uh, fingers crossed, touch wood. Let's not make any guarantees or promises here. Uh, an episode every fortnight uh, of the 2080 Fullcast. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who came up to our booths at uh, Thought Bubble in November and New York Comic Con the, n- the month before and said how much you enjoyed this Fullcast. It really was wonderfully touching um, and so kind of you. And uh, thank you. Uh, you have inspired me to start again. Uh, so. Yeah, that's going to be this episode. Um, you'll notice those of you watching on YouTube that I'm wearing one of the official 2000 AD Christmas jumpers with art by uh, by Mick McMahon, which are still available from the uh, Rebellion uh, web shop, not the 2000 AD web shop, the, the, the main Rebellion one. Um, and it's not been uh, an easy few weeks. Uh, the consequences of the postal strike and disruption to deliveries mean that uh, an awful lot of Earthlets out there have not had their deliveries of the prog and Meg and the Christmas prog and everything. And we can only apologise for that. It's beyond our control. We continue to try and find ways uh, around it to make sure that Thrill Power gets out to you on time. But thank you to everyone for your patience as we try to deal with uh, a difficult situation. Um, Without much further ado, I'm going to wish you all uh, a very Zajaz Christmas and a Gaffelbet New Year from everybody at 2000 AD and Rebellion. And uh, yeah, here's to a slightly less stressful uh, 2023. And we'll see you the other side of New Year. Splendid birth rig, Earthlets. Uh, so here at New York Comic Con, I am slightly the worst for wear, which is the perfect time to do a podcast recording. Uh, but I'm joined by very, very, three very special guests. One of the things uh, I wanted to do uh, with the, the relaunch of the podcast was to pay tribute to Alan Grant. Um, and we've not that, had that opportunity uh, to do that yet. So we've gathered together some guests, some who knew him, some who have opinions on him. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity to just talk over the man, the career, the inf- you know the influence and the legacy of Alan Grant. So I'm joined by uh, Garth Ennis, Hello. Um, Chloe Maville, and Dan Raspler, Hello. Uh, who's a, a former editor at uh, DC, who we- worked with, with Alan. Um, Dan, I, I want to come to you first and, and just, right. just get your, what's your abiding memories of, of working with, with Alan? Well, um, we became friends very early on in my career. I got to DC, 88, 89, and uh, he was working on Detective Comics with John, John Wagner, and uh, we became very friendly very quickly, and I was sort of a, uh, you know, a lost uh, lamb when I first got there, and he really helped me out. And uh, he, he taught me a lot about both comics and just like being a man in a, the world, you know? He was just a great, great fella. Uh, uh, incredible sense of humor, but sort of a- angry at things that dis- required anger. But um, a real gentleman. He was. It was. It was great. And uh, uh, my uh, my first impression of like his his work, I think, is the the humor, the sort of dark humor in it. I would say to answer the question. Guys, what, what, what about you? I mean, you know, you, 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 uh, you came to work at 2008 having. Um, don't know the other way, that's right. A bit of a not a child prodigy, but a, 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 young, a young Turk, let's put it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, as, as Dan has just said, Alan had this incredible knack for encouraging others. Yes. Uh, what, what's your memories of it? Um, I I have a slightly different experience than a lot of writers of of my generation because I didn't meet Alan until I was already in the business. We know that there were so many people like Mark and Grant and, and Alan Moore who you know, he in some cases discovered and encouraged and, and pushed and he was always doing that. Um, but I met him after I was in the business so we, we just became friends really. Uh, there was no actual work aspect to it. Um, and he, as Dan says he was tremendous. He, he really was. He was exactly the guy you wanted Alan Grant to be, you know, uh, you want the people whose work you admire when you get into the business to be good guys, yeah. and he was great, you know, he was kind and he was welcoming and black as midnight sense of humor. Uh, he couldn't have been better, really. Yeah. It, 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 one of the things that, that uh, has always struck me about Alan's work is, uh, particularly when he was writing with John Wagner, 
is how they complemented each other so perfectly. They, they seem to have an instinctive understanding of each other's strengths and, and, and weaknesses. Um, when, uh, when he was writing for DC, working on Detective Comics, uh, you know, went on to, to work on Demon, Lobo, things like that. Um, do, do, do you think his, his voice changed? Do you, do you think that he adapted himself or was it just, this is, this is what I do now and scream a lot of you? Well, when you're working in the franchise the way he did, when there's all sorts of license considerations and other editors involved, you definitely have to sort of compromise your initial instincts, um, which is why we ended up sort of carving out his own little sector of the DC universe for him so that he could just sort of make up his own guys and play by himself, where he, uh, he wrote The Demon Monthly, uh, and then Lobo, which didn't have a lot of interactions with the rest of the, with the, rest of the playing field. Um, I, I, I'm not really suited to tell the difference between him and with Wagner and then him on his own. Garth might be better to uh, uh, observe that. I mean, what, what's, what's your what's your abiding uh, kind of memory take on on his work for DC? Because uh, one of the things that, that really stood out uh, when he passed away was how many people essentially came out and went. It, it's one of the, his Batman work is like a definitive run, you know, when he was working with Norman Brayford. Yep, on Detective Comics. Yeah. Yep. What, 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 what's kind of, what was the kind of secret sauce that means that people still remember that? And I think it? part of it is that he was ambitious to create new villains and that a lot of the previous writers would just resuscitate the same, they're the greatest rogues gallery in comics, uh, but, you know, Joker back, Penguin back, Catwoman back again. And Alan with John came up with whatever, the rat catcher or cadaver or uh, ventriloquist, uh, anarchy. There's a handful of just original supervillains that they, rogues, that they added to the, uh, added to it with that same sort of like high energy uh, that they had to, I guess that they learned meeting weekly deadlines at 2000 AD with who are we gonna put in dread this time, come up with some new cockamamie weirdo. Yeah. Um, so the Dread villains aren't too far off from the Batman villains, if you think about it. I, I remember John saying something about the, the ventriloquist was something they, they'd specifically saved from somewhere else. It was like, this, this, this will be a... Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, he said that in that interview recently. I remember that, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, 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 what, what, what's your memory of, of Alan's work for, for, this, for the States? Well, I mean, the, the, for the States? For the States, yeah. Um, detective, Demon... Uh, which I followed him on, actually, Lobo. Um, I, I was honestly, to, I really was honestly more interested in his 2000 AD stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting, you know, on Batman, who I think is portrayed as quite a noble character, significantly more noble than most of the characters Alan wrote for 2000 AD, you know, who are cops and bounty hunters and private detectives. Uh, possible exception to Judge Anderson. So it was when he went over to the States and started writing a character like Batman, it was a little odd for me. Um, although I'm, I'm just naturally, I don't have much affinity for those characters anyway. Um, I mean, I feel that the impact he makes on 2000 is really, it's the impact he makes on John's work. So, you know, when he comes in in like 178 or something and he's writing Dread with John and all of a sudden Dread's it becomes a bit closer to the street. Like, yeah. Dredd doesn't have so much of a stick up his ass. He's not so upright. Um, John wrote him, you know, between the cursed earth and, and Alan coming aboard. He he is quite a, a, a sort of an upright character. Yeah. He, he really has a sense of poise. All of a sudden, Alan comes aboard and he's like a cop and it's down and dirty and there's a focus on mega city crime. Uh, Strontium dog, Johnny, is less noble all of a sudden and more laconic and it, it becomes that space spaghetti western it was it always was meant to be yeah, yeah. uh robo hunter gets crazier <laughs> and it was already pretty crazy but i think it's it's the impact he has where he just he just pushes the characters um down off their high horses a little bit look at johnny alpha in you know journey into hell where he, he is quite a noble character making proclamations about is there, my God, is there no end to the evil of this place? You couldn't really imagine Johnny of the sort of Schickelgruber grab era 
saying things like that. Yeah. Um, he was more like even when he runs it at the end of, Port, of uh, Portrait of a Mutant, he barely says anything to Creelman. I think he just mutters something about the people he was killed and then time trap, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. So that there aren't these proclamations anymore, and I really feel like Alan's responsible for for a lot of that. That was his effect on John's work. I mean, do you see that exactly that quality that Garth has described is the reason why something like Batman, who, who you know, as you say, is is, is noble and all that and other. Right. Well, well, Alan was unusual among British creators in that he was very into American comics. Yeah. And I think that was one of the reasons why Wagner stepped away from Detective Comics before too long, was because he just didn't have that, whatever, that, that part of you is that sort of bubblegum sensibility, yeah. uh, where that's in a way, this is kid stuff, um, where John was just a, you know, sort of a harder, or the stories weren't as, as uh, absurdist. Or, you can't say that John's stories weren't absurd. So not as, not as <laughs> whim, you know, pure whimsy. Uh, not that Alan's stuff is pure whimsy either. But um, the, uh, um, his, uh, his, his love for the American comics, I think, came through respect for Batman as the sort of goody, even though it's, it's dark. And it's much his dark stuff, even though it's dark, is much less dark than it has become. Now it's infinitely darker than the stuff, the Bray Fogel. Grant run, uh, just straight ahead comics, nothing too dark about it. Hey, Chloe, I want, I want to come to you because uh, I wanted to bring you on board to talk a little bit about the, the, the context of Alan and the legacy uh, of, of his work. Because, you know, you've got two different worlds here. You've got uh, weekly British comics and you've got monthly American comics. You've got Judge Dredd's iconic British character, Batman iconic American character. Um, what, what do you think is the overall impact and legacy of, of Alan's work? Well, I think him having his start uh, with 2080 and, and in British comics made such a difference for how he handled American comics because you had to churn these out weekly and you had to get these stories that were, that were relatively self-contained so that any week that you could pick them up and kind of figure out just based on context what was going on. And that's somewhat of a rarity at that point in American comics. <laughs> Um, so, like, uh, I grew up with, with Grant's Batman. Like, that's my Batman. And part of the beauty of it, um, picking up a comic at a certain age was picking up that Batman comic, just a ra I couldn't tell you what issue, but a random issue, and being able to understand immediately what I was reading. It was so self-contained, issue by issue, and I think that him having this start in British comics kind of added to that because he had to learn how to make these stories something for everybody to understand no matter if they were brand new to it, if they had been following from issue one of his run. Um, and I think that's that's ultimately like the biggest part of this legacy is you can pick up any Alan Grant comic and know you where you are. And and it's so character driven uh, in a, and even the 2080 stuff, uh, so much of it before Grant really came and, and became this, this big powerful force was action driven, theme driven. And I think that he, especially in conjunction with Wagner, started to make it more character focused. And you got more of an emotional aspect of these characters and where their head was at and why they were being driven to do what they do and say what they say. And he he made the world bigger. That's, that's what it comes down to is uh, by making these things smaller, he made the entire world bigger the way he chose to handle them. Dan, working with Alan on a, book, uh, on a, on a regular monthly comic, yeah. was, it, uh, was it an in-depth relationship, you know, was it a lot of back and forth, or was, was he the kind of writer that you could say, you know what, you, you get on with it and I trust you? Oh yeah, he didn't, he didn't need any hand-holding whatsoever. I mean, there is a lot of, somebody's talking about the job of the editor and all the different hats the editor has, and there's some guys that really need attention. And Alan was good for like one phone call at the beginning of the month and then a call when the script came in. Yeah. Never missed a deadline, you know, always included whatever references, to totally professional. Even when, you know, DC content creators had to deal with sort of sudden diktats from upstairs, now there's going to be a crossover. Now you can't use this character that you were promised that you could use because somebody else changed their mind. 
and all this. Now you have to include, like, uh, at one point, was it the second Tim Burton movie when Vicki Vale entered the story? Which they, they resurrected Vicki Vale from old continuity. Batman hadn't had a girlfriend in years. And so they reinserted her into the comic, and Alan included her in the comic, but by the end of the story, he has Batman in his thought balloon saying, the Batman needs no kiss on the cheek. Vicky? Vicky who? And that's as he swings through the night. Vicky who? That was Alan's response to following the continuity. Uh, I, I don't know what issue that is. Somewhere, you know, somewhere deep in the run. One of the things, Chloe, you, you um, found a copy of it uh, at this very event, which was uh, jo uh, John and Alan uh, writing Punisher. Yeah. And taking him to Scotland. <laughs> Blood on the Moors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and that, that's something that, that I always look at, you know, even with um, even with Batman, all of a sudden it's the McWaynes. Right. And, and all roads lead to Scotland with yeah, Graham, yeah. 100%. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, I mean, do, do, we, do we think like, that's, that's actually part of. That's an express part. That's the expression for me of actually just how in control John and uh, Alan. Alan especially was when writing that they could say, you know, I'm going to just do the most ridiculous thing and almost dare you to stop them. <laughs> you know, yeah. so they committed the, to the bit. Yeah, I mean, the front cover of that book, it's got the uh, Punisher with, with a, the sword. With a, like, a, a claymore that almost as tall as he is. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Garth, Gar is, is that ultimately one of the reasons why he's writing a appeal to so many people? that there is this uh, confidence and assuredness about it. Yeah, let's just go ahead and do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Alan, Alan, when you think about it, did a lot of work over the years. I mean, a hell of a lot of work because he basically took on everything that he was offered. I mean, I remember him doing things like Robocop, which was this dire Marvel <laughs> handling of the character, you know, and Alan just took it. You know, it was a job. He took it. He'd been offered it. Um, so, you know, he really, he really did put out a tremendous amount of stuff, but I, I think it was, at the same time, it was easy to tell the ones that he liked. Yeah. He really loved Globo, he loved the demon, he responded to those sort of wicked characters, you know, those, those ones with a bad attitude. Right. Um, he got into that thing, Legion 89 or whatever. Yeah, Legion, I think it started in 87 and it went on 89 and went all the way out. I think he got into that just because Maybe when he took the job, he wasn't that into it, but I think he just fell in love with the characters yep. as he went through. And yep. of course, ultimately, they got Lobo out of that. Yep. Um, it, it's interesting when you see in, in later years, he's talking about how he doesn't like Dread anymore. He wouldn't want to write Dread. He doesn't recognize Mega City 1. He seems to have just veered away from that that sort of quite brutal dark humor of the classic Wagner and Grand era where it was almost like let's see how unlikable we can make the character <laughs> like let's let's just have him putting the boot into people um, and Alan seemed to have sort of veered away from that in a way that perhaps John didn't um, so yes it, it, it's funny as Dan says he did enjoy American comics in a way that many of us didn't and so Perhaps a character like Batman, although it wasn't to my taste, perhaps that was a better fit for him as, as he got older, where you have like a, an essentially decent, noble character who fights for what's right, as opposed to uh, a future cop who's a fascist monster, or even uh, a space bounty hunter who, good guy though he is, has racked up quite a body <laughs> uh, When you say space bounty hunter, you mean Lobo? Strontium dog. Oh, Strontium dog. Yeah. Okay, because Lobo is no way a, a good guy. No, I mean, but, what, what, what I, would, I would point to him and the demon as being more just daft, sort of, I said wicked earlier, right, you wicked, know. Wicked, but always with Alan, as, uh, not to put words in your mouth, like a sense of humor. Right. He Huge. wouldn't be interested in that without which I would, I would draw a line between that and his work on Batman, and I would say he was doing something a bit more serious yeah. there, and the side of him that had maybe lost interest in 2000 AD found an outlet on on Batman, whereas when he's doing Lobo and Batman, uh, sorry, Lobo and the Demon, he's just having a laugh. Yep. 
he's having a hoot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember I took over the demon from him and I had to sort of tidy up a couple of dangling plot threads and it was pretty hilarious stuff, you know, it was great fun. Yeah. And kind of in between all of that too, you get uh, things like the outcasts and tattered banners, which right. were just uh, just kind of a mess, but in a, it was it was stupid done well. Uh, right. and, and and I think that's part of the gift that you got, particularly from that period of the '90s with him, is just like uh, an eye for doing zany and absurd that just kind of worked in smart ways if you read it all the way through it just works in ways that honestly if anybody else wrote it it just wouldn't mm. um and especially especially when you can see him like on the outcasts get into the groove it starts out as this very serious story and then you see something fall off a little bit like two issues in and it becomes this goofy zany thing and somebody ends up in a bucket and like and it and it all by the end ties up neatly in a way that works with just as any of his other books. So it was, it's just a good period for him, honestly. I remember that. I remember the outcasts, as you say, starting out as quite a grim future oh, dystopia yeah. story. And then halfway through, it was, it's almost like you can see their interests starting to ebb a bit. And it's yeah. like, I know how we'll get interested in this again. We'll start making fun of everything. There will be, you know, like a huge fun fair with, with a million ways for people yep. to commit suicide, suicide and things like that. And all of that stuff. I still remember the guy simply riding a motorbike off a roof yeah. onto a spike. <laughs> you know, karma. But it, it, it is interesting that, you know, on, on the dafter stuff, in a way, I think it may have been part of what contributed to the breakup of the, the partnership because they have trouble doing darker stuff together. Um, they closed down City of the Damned because it's, you know, it's gotten nastier and nastier and they just can't figure out what they're doing with it. Um, Last American only lasts four issues. It was supposed to go 12. Oz, they, they can't agree on the ending, which is you know, at one point going to be quite grim with Dredd shooting Chopper in the back. And it's th at that point that maybe Alan's sort of dafter zanier side starts to come out. And he, he in particular can't stay with the grim stuff. Whereas John, of course, is able to then write Button Man. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I think it's, it's their natural tendency. And maybe Alan did have it a bit more than John to take the piss. That ultimately ends things. I mean, they still do stuff together. We know that, but the stuff that they do together is the the, the zanier stuff, like Dread Batman. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, I wanted to talk about <clears throat> Lobo a little bit because it's not a character I know particularly well. But I, I, I remember when um, was it the New Fifty Two when they they kind of made. They, they, Incorporated they did him the whole redesign of it. Yeah, they've yeah, updated him a couple awful. times. Yeah, and, uh, it, and, and I saw a lot of comment about it. This, this doesn't work. This, you know, no, you well, I mean, part of it is it's sort of the essential absurdism of this. He's so hard that he can ride a bike and motorcycle in space with a leather jacket, <laughs> and that's it. Like, that's how tough he is. And uh, I used to get the... Uh, the Green Lantern editor used to complain to me because we used to say like brar and the motorcycle sound effects <laughs> and he would say there's no sound effects in space I was like Lobo is so tough that his motorcycle that he can breathe in space and talk because he has to talk in space you got to think at somebody in space so you know there's this high energy rock and roll uh, and in fact I just saw Bisley at, in Artist Alley today oh, right, right. Who, uh, um, He's still going strong, but the uh, uh, yeah, Keith Giffen came up with Lobo. I think it was Omega Men, and then they wow. brought him into Justice League, and then they took him for this Legion spinoff of it was not Millennium, it was the Invasion. They did the big Invasion crossover, in 1990 or something, 91, and then Giffen spun Legion 89 out of that and took Alan to do the dialogue. And that's when Alan first started writing Lobo. Right. And then from that, they did the Lobo miniseries, uh, Last Zarnian. <clears throat> and then the rest is history. Like, Alan ended up uh, doing I think all that Al stuff. Alan's own attitude to Lobo was quite interesting because he, he talked about how he thought the way to go was just a series of miniseries and one shots. The characters too daft to sustain a monthly yep. so let's just keep and DC said no we want to do a monthly because the sales on the miniseries are great 
and like this is a mistake uh, do you so you don't want to do it oh no I'll do it because you know there's gonna be royalties on the first issue so uh, you know if anyone's gonna make them it's gonna be me so I mean he was right the Lobo Monthly didn't last. It went a few I mean, years. It went a few years. It I mean, probably the, went longer three, than he expected. Four years, something like that. It probably went longer than he expected, but I, I don't think the character is really built no. to, sur to, to survive we, a monthly book we without... We knew that going in yeah. as the guy who made the call to say, yeah, we're going to do it. I want you to do it. Yeah. As that guy who knew that he should only be in miniseries. If you look at the publishing schedule, we kept putting out those cockamamie miniseries throughout the monthly, yes. constant weird sh stuff that Alan would come up with, yes. and I would find an artist, and we would just crank out Lobo miniseries. I mean, the problem with the monthly was, perhaps, it got tired. that Lobo is quite an annoying character right. in a lot of ways, right. and eventually you got to the point where it's like, I'm not sure how much more of this I can right. take. Right, right. So know? we had to surround him with a sympathetic supporting cast, right. and you know, bounty hunters left and right and all, all this stuff. Um, it was, you know, it was a su successful series, but uh, creatively, Lobo is a sort of one joke character, yeah. best mm -hmm. for the miniseries, yeah. best for the quick appearance in and out. Um, he used a, a, a phrase a minute ago, which is rock and roll, to, yeah. to describe Lobo. Right. But it's, it's one thing that, that um, always struck me about Alan was, was even, even in person, you know, for us, Oh, no, no, I'm watching the levels on it. Okay, it's, okay. it's fine. It's, my arm's getting tired. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> a lot of the... Uh, there was a lot of that kind of rock and roll spirit of that wildness. And uh, we were talking about that uh, photo in the, te Daily, uh, the Sunday Telegraph oh, feature Christ, yeah. from like, 1984, where... Um, it's, it, it was earlier than that. Where, um, where they're launching Eagle Comics, the, the, the Dread Reprints in the States. And photographer's like, well, what am I going to do with these two blokes? And so John is sat in a garden chair holding a copy of the Judge Trade Annual, <laughs> um, looking very grumpy in a cardigan. And then Alan is kind of leaning on his shoulder, this wild mane of hair, um, a leather jacket, jacket that was good. and holding yeah. um, a, a, a Robocop replica <laughs> pistol. And he's just got this expression on his face, and he. he he just makes it because he's got this energy to him, like this rangy wildness. Mm -hmm. I always felt that that did come out in his work. That you know, you, you, you never. I always felt he was never a writer you could underestimate. Hmm. That's you know? a good way of putting it. Um, yeah. And, and, and I mean, in terms of, of highlights of his career for you, what, can, can you pick one? Wow. Uh, I mean. I mean, I would, I would go all the way back to, I'm, I'm gonna pick more than one, but I would go all the way back to Black Hawk, oh, because yeah. once you go through the black hole in that story, and there's no question that Massimo's doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but Alan was coming up with some amazing stuff. Um, but then, you know, moving on, Christ. Uh, I guess I'll tell you my favorites. I mean, my favorite John the M-Dog story is the Moses incident where they take the little, the, the dead boy to the island of Malak Brood and they end up fighting zombies in an alien churchyard. You know, there's just something brilliant about that. Dread, Apocalypse War, you know, the big moment. Um, I mean, I love Robo Hunter and the Britsit stuff and National Song Year and all the, and, and the unmentionable one. That's meat and drink to me. It really, really is. Um, but I mean, uh, I can't choose a single one, you know. I'd have. To, oh, uh, tell you what though, what they did together, the last American, that is a stunning piece of work. It it really is, and I think John wrote. They came up with the idea together as usual, and then John scripted the first two, and Alan scripted the second two, and that last issue, where he's making his way through the underground base and slowly realizing what it was used for, uh, I think is a, is a stunning piece of writing. Uh, absolutely beautiful. You were nodding along when uh, Garth was talking about yeah. Black Hole. Uh, is, is there a particular highlight of uh, Alan's work for you? Uh, I mean, Black Hawk is definitely up there. That's one of the really, like, if you're going really old school with it, yeah. that is absolutely one of them. Um, I mean, The Last American is, is one of mine. It's just, it's so well contained and it hits so hard. It just builds and builds and builds to this, this huge ending that kind of knocks you all the way back. Um, 
but I'm like very, very uh, partial to Strontium Dog, and uh, I grew up on Batman and Lobo, so I kind of automatically am, am drawn to those. But I mean, honestly, Last American, if I have to choose absolutely one, mm. I mean, it's just that combined with McMahon, you just can't, yeah. you can't beat it. It's it's kind of a perfect book. Don, what, what about you? <coughs> um, boy, like a, a piece of work to his, for him to stand out. I, you know, the run with Norm on Detective Comics is really a non pareil You know, like it's a sublime comics run. Um, and then uh, so much great stuff in Lobo. It's hard, you know, the... Uh, uh, the series was great, but Alan uh, stretching his legs on the weird little mini series here and there, I think, is, is, is tremendous as well. Um, so I'd have to say some, somewhere between those two. I'm not as a, a, a familiar with uh, um, the 2000 AD stuff. I've read a bunch of it. Uh, but uh, to me, I think it's probably him and Bray Fogel uh, left to their own devices for the most part month after month both getting better at what they're doing um, and to uh, to address what it is about to go back to the earlier topic about like what it is about Batman because it wasn't absurd but he never used a gun which is absurd right like that's the difference it's that this heroic ideal of Batman would never ever pick up a gun in the movies now he uses guns but at the time in the comics that was a that was a law. Like his parents were killed with a gun, he'll never touch a gun. And, Bat and Alan loved that. He never pushed to have Batman pick up a, a gun. It bothered him when he had a, when he read other comics with Batman. He's like, why is he picking up a fucking gun? <laughs> that was a flawless impression. Well, <laughs> yeah. but I, I, one of the other qualities that always makes me. I, I, um, I try to interview. John and Alan on Zoom in like 2021 and it just didn't work the, the, the technology was getting in the way of them actually having a proper conversation but one of the things we did talk about was their attitude towards authority right. and how huh. both of them are marked in different ways by being witness to the injustice and the unfairness of power um, and you know John, John had his, his his own issues but with Ali you know he was left handed kid beaten until he wrote with his right hand and then would do essentially mirror writing and then he'd get a beating for that as well it, it seemed to ingrain in him this hatred and distrust of all authority and uh, actually it, it, that, that's a question really that I want to ask you Dan because it's obvious in his 2000 AD stuff that you know he hates authority he's, 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 yep. uh, you know Power in his stories does terrible things. Yep. But then when you're, you're looking at superheroes, the power dynamics are very different. The satire isn't necessarily always there. How, how well, do you think, did that, did that come out in his Part design? of the weirdness and the absurdity of Batman is that usually he's getting along with the police. So like the commissioner calls him, like the absurd, like unconstitutionality of the, you know, whatever getting the vigilante to do what the cops are supposed to do. Like that is, you just sort of accept it. You don't question it and you move on from there so that Batman can go be a detective and punch the bad guys and swing around. Um, and so I don't know how well his, that particular hobby horse of his, not uh, you know the uh, problem with authority, I think he probably saved that up for Lobo. <laughs> and Batman wasn't so much the, uh, the rebel. Uh, character. I don't. He ever. He never even did one of those sort of trope cliche things where all the superheroes wanted to be one way and Batman wants it to be something else. Alan never even did anything like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't. I, I can't really recall it. Um, now, I'm going to uh, mention that uh, back that Legion comic that he did, which he started scripting and then uh, uh, Legion '89, uh, and we changed the title every year. Um, Keith Giffen created it and started uh, plotting it. Alan always wrote the dialogue, and then Keith disappeared, and Alan wrote the whole thing. And that was a real meditation on authority, because the leader of the group was a fascist maniac. And so all the ca other characters were sort of their own rebelling against the uh, authoritarian 
boss in their own way. So Alan always had that in his in his work. It, it's uh, uh, one of my favorite things in. Um, uh, they did a Comics Journal interview, and I think about 1988. So just as their partnership is is coming to an end, um, and they, they, they're clearly sharing kind of little nodding in jokes with each other. And Frank Plowright, who's the, the person interviewing them, doesn't pick up on them because he doesn't understand them. And there's a, a, a but there's a moment where um, uh, Plowright asks them, um, you know, are, are, you, are you quite right wing or left wing and uh, they, they describe themselves as um, uh, left wing people with right wing tendencies and Plowright says oh so flared trouser men and, and you can see it on the page they're both baffled by this they go well yeah we, I guess I've still got a pair of flared trousers and, but there, there was always that that humour that warmth that affection so even when they were laying into Things. Mm. It was it was done with a smile, like it, 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 it's it's almost as if uh, it works because they're laughing at him. They're not just shouting at him. Yeah. Um, well, I think you know, there's there's an absurdity to power quite often that guys like that, guys like Alan, are going to respond to. I mean, he's, he's talked about DC Thompson, where he's pulled up on the dress code by a man who's dressed for a weekend's fishing. <laughs> You know, with the plus fours and the caters yeah, and all yeah. that, um, he gets a bollocking because uh, he's he's got a part-time job as a waiter, and he finds himself one night serving uh, uh, one of the DC Thompson senior staff, and he is then he's told in the office the next week you, you can't have an extra job because we don't want people thinking that we don't pay our employees enough money. It's like, well, you don't pay me enough money. That's why I need the extra job. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think he 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 and John, of course, were able to channel the absurdity uh, of something like that and, and bring it into their work. I mean, it, it it's interesting if you consider it in the context of Dread because there he's the authority figure. But there is some, there is something slightly ridiculous and absurd about Dread. Anyway, it's just that you wouldn't dare tell him so. Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, but there, there is, I mean, Brian Bolland, I remember, talked about Dread as a character, and he said, you know, he postures and poses and struts. He's ridiculous looking, and that, that hadn't occurred to me before, but, you know, I think I think uh, someone like Alan is going to be aware of that, and he's, he's going to uh, enjoy a character, say, like Chopper, who's initially created to take the piss out of the judges, you know, to, to give Justice Department a hard time. Um, that's an interesting character to consider in that context, actually. So, um, uh, after he um, started work for DC, he created um, Anarchy, yep. which is a, a, a not chopper, but a, a, you know that kind of young rebellious. Yeah. He was into his objectivism at the time, kind of Van Randyism and, and, and whatnot. Um, and just being able to do that to, to, to just create characters that work. Yes. And combine all those qualities. I mean, Chloe, it, it, with, with, with something like Anarchy, uh, with characters like Chopper, um, are those? Do you think those are characters that, that uh, are meant to appeal to young, young readers, the kind of readers that oh, we think they're Oh, absolutely, about? absolutely. Um, especially because I think what made the what makes that writing so good is that there is well into their old age, a very, very punk sensibility. And the kind of, the, that kind of attitude that you can really only harness when you're like 20, young 20 something, 19 whatever, and rebellious and like trying to be mad at the right things and not quite knowing and kind of taking the piss out of everything just in case you miss something. And then you finally figure out what there is to be mad at and you direct like, uh, and I think they do a good job at picking the right moments in every single one of these books um, to make that seriousness hit home in a way that's meant to matter amid all of that joking and making light and having in-jokes. Um, and, and that's honestly what makes it work is, is still harnessing that, that rebellious feeling for something good while still having a good time with it. Like, they, they, there are so many stories Again, well, well into his age, where you can tell that he's still very young at heart, and that's part of what keeps, uh, what kept the writing so fresh and so there for younger generations 
growing up reading them. It's just, it's, it's the pushback, but also kind of nah, nah, nah about everything. And it, it's, it's, it's kind of perfect. <laughs> but I, I, when someone passes away, there's always that overriding, obvious sense of loss. With, with Alan Gunn, you know, he wasn't as prolific later on as he, as he had been when he was young. He had an awful lot of health problems. But with his, what, it seems like an odd question, but with his passing, what, what do you think we've lost with Alan no longer? A, a very important part of 2000 AD history. A guy who came along and began as, as uh, the assistant editor on the comic, and I think gave it a good kick up the arse when it occasionally needed it. I mean, you know, Alan being Alan, I'm sure he needled and fought and argued and was the, you know, an endless irritation to people like John Sanders. Um, Steve McManus in his book talks about how he always felt he had a strange relationship with Alan as if, and this is how Steve puts it, there was a conversation we should have had that we never did. And I wonder if, you know, that that's maybe Alan constantly poking and, and saying, we have to be better, we have to make it better. Steve mentions an, in, an instance where he says, well, I think we've had a great year. And Alan and Kelvin Gosnell go, no, not really. And Steve's quite taken aback. So Alan is constantly pushing. Yeah. It's like, we've got to do better. And then I talked about the impact he had on John's writing when he comes in the 2008, when he, when he comes up to 2008, these characters as a writer. Um, that's vitally important because it takes dread and strong places that they might not otherwise have gone. It was the breath of fresh air that John needed, I think, to, to get those characters another four or five years down the line. Or, well, it was actually seven until their partnership ended, I think. Um, so his, his impact on the comic, I, I just don't think can be underestimated, both as editor and writer. Uh, you know, a, a vitally important character. I don't worry about you because he's, 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 he had a very set time at DC and then right he uh, um, went on to greater success than he ever had with me once he did the uh, uh, Batman uh, it, it, um, like the, the Gotham City kept getting blown up and they had diseases and all these big crossover events uh, that were big production numbers that he did but I don't think his heart was in it the way they were with the sort of one-offs that he was permitted to do uh, when I was just this sort of assistant editor on the book. Um, but I'm going to have a sort of selfish answer to this question, which is what I miss is ever being able to talk to him. Um, it was just a wonderful raconteur and a real stylist, just real personality. Like he was a, an avid gardener kind of thing. Uh, he was like a, a, a speed demon drive behind the wheel. Uh, uh, always telling the truth. Uh, you can never tell if he was mad or tell, cracking a joke. Like he's just had this sort of expression. Um, and uh, just as I said at the be at, at the beginning, I got I feel like I got to DC when I was a kid, and you know I sort of learned how to be a professional from from him because he never missed a deadline. You know, he he, he always knew when everything was. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, you know, I miss a friend. That's really what it is for me at this point. Not a very useful answer, but it's <laughs> no, honest no, no, at least. No, it's, it's lovely, it's lovely. And Chloe, uh, in terms of um, you know those those runs that everyone talks about, the, the, the Brave Vogel stuff, uh, his logo, and all that. Do you, do you think? And this is a very leading question from somebody from Britain who doesn't really read Sabira comics. Do you think, uh, the, particularly the American industry, was poor without it? Oh, absolutely. Um, if I was going to answer the same question that you gave them, oh my God. <laughs> um, it's, I think that ultimately, uh, especially in America, we lost a pillar of one of the people that knew how to make comics entertaining. And I think that there are a lot of really creative people still within the industry, but I think that Grant in particular was somebody that knew the balance of how to make comics fun. And that doesn't always mean goofy, and it doesn't always mean serious, but it means finding a way to balance everything out so that you want to read it every week, every month, every whenever your favorite book comes out, he managed to do that. And I think that, that having him missing and gone is, uh, it's, it just takes a blow. It's one more person that, that 
you know, really did shape comics that's no longer with us and, and doesn't and isn't able to pass it on in the same way that they were when they were here. So it's that's basically it. It's just it's it's hard to see the one of these one of these iconic figures uh, missing from the from the American industry. Um, I want to round off uh, with something you've you've bought a lot right. of Garth, right. which is uh, uh, an extract from a. Well, yeah, a Alan and I corresponded quite a bit throughout sort of 89, 90 kind of time and um, uh, just sort of chatting about stuff really. And uh, I remember he, he told me about visiting New York for the first time, about the helicopter ride after dark. You know, he told I me. the helicopter. There you go. Uh, dinner at the you know the windows on the world on the the top of the world trade I paid center. For that dinner. <laughs> there you go. Um, he also told me, and this was an interesting thing. I remember him saying that he had met on that trip a number of he didn't mention any names, but a number of figures from American comics who he personally thought of as some of the greats. And he said they live some of them not far off the breadline. And he was, you know, yet another guy, like along with Alan Moore and John and Pat, who said, own what you create because you don't want to end up like that. But we talked a lot about 2000 AD and stuff, and I asked him about Alec Trench. Hey, for, for, for those who are listening who don't right. know who Alec Trench is, explain. Alec Trench, well, there's Alec Trench, the character in the comic who was a writer who submitted a, t a story to 2000 AD, he got mixed up with some aliens and, and died in an accident. And from then on, in every Tharg story that John and Alan wrote, his poster would appear on the nerve center. Well, this weird, weird, sort of fuzzy-faced wee man with a Tama Shanter and Alec Trench, yeah, wee brammer or something <laughs> like that. So I asked, what the hell was, was Alec Trench? And Alan replied, Alec Trench, ha, okay, you asked. Alec Trench was the name of the old man who drove the ice cream van in the Scottish mining village where my parents live. When I first burned to be a writer, one of my ideas was to turn a real character into a fictitious character and then represent the fictitious one as the real one. I was into drugs as well. I chose Alec Trench, so if you examine my desk in St. Mary's College of Divinity in St. Andrews, you'll find Alec Trench was here and the date. If you listen to the tapes of the early 70s Alan Freeman radio show, you'd hear, I have seen them, a touching poem about the plight of old age pensioners. Uh, read out on, on the air by Mr. Freeman, who thanked Alec with a frog in his throat for the masterpiece he'd written. If you listen to the local history tape project in Dundee Public Library, you'll hear an interview with local lifeboatman Alec Trench. And another tape, you'll hear an exciting account of the shipwreck of the SS Ecky Trench which is believed to have sunk in the Firth of Tay with a cargo of hams and cheeses. <laughs> Alec used to write to the papers, check back issues of Enemy and Melody Maker, where he slagged off David Bowie and praised Gary Glitter. Alec Trench scratched his name on a stone in the Canadian Rockies. He has written to councils and politicians. He has scrawled graffiti in Glasgow phone boxes. He traced his name in the sand of a, Sp in the sand of a Spanish beach. To the best of my knowledge, his portrait has appeared in every Tharg story John and I have written. Alec also wrote one story himself, Close Encounter of the Fatal Kind, way back around Probe 120. The real Alec is long dead. There he is. <laughs> if I have managed to confuse anyone in his long career, my task will not have been in vain. <laughs> you can keep that if you want it's a copy. Of, uh, yeah. I mean, is there a greater expression of... Alan's personality, and basically a, a decades-long art piece. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there's a bit more, but it's just Alec and that old joke about Frank Sinatra. Right. You no, know it. No. I mean, I can. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, all right. I'm, lo I'm loving every second. All of this. right. So this is an old. This is an old joke, but all he's done is he's inserted Alec Trench. Uh, in the late 50s, a popular joke went the rounds. Local man Alec Trench won 50,000 quid on the football polls, splurged out on a trip to Vegas where he met a beautiful young girl. Alec did everything he could to impress her without much success. Knowing she was a Frank Sinatra fan, he took her to see the great man's show at one of the big hotels. Thinking to set the seal in the evening, Alec went backstage to see Frank before his date turned up. 
he used his not inconsiderable charm to let the singer see how important it was that he impressed the girl. Wouldn't it be great if after the show, Frank would come over to the table and say something like, hey, it's my old friend Alec from Scotland, long time no see, etc. Frank, uh, being a nice Italian kid, agreed. So after the show, and the young lady, which the young lady thought was terrific, Frank came over to the table and made a big show of greeting Alec. Hey, my long lost Scottish buddy, I haven't seen you for what, 10 years, 15? Whereupon Alec pulled an impatient face, put his arm around the girl and said, oh, for fuck's sake, Frank, know the now. Can you know see him with somebody? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess. Oh, yeah. if, you, if you want to keep that's that. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's really wonderful. Thank you for that because <laughs> no that's... No worries. Yeah, like I said, I don't think there's a, a better encapsulation of uh, <laughs> Alan's personality than that. Uh, so I, I think we'll wrap up now, but thank you so much to, uh, to Garth, to Chloe and to Dan. Um, I mean, we could probably talk for hours more about Alan uh, and what a great guy he was and the impact of his work on uh, so many of us. But uh, I think uh, for now, yeah, uh, RIP, Alan Grant. We shall not see his like again. No. Great stuff. Well, um, thank you both for bearing with us on this. I really appreciate it. And, and particularly if you're not feeling too well, Alan. That's okay. Uh, one thing I, I, I've always been intrigued by, because I've, I've obviously read a lot of interviews of the two of you uh, separately. One thing I've always been intrigued by is your first impressions of each other. Like when you first encountered, because you, you, you'd known each other for a while before you worked together, hadn't you? Yep. Yeah, we knew each other when we worked at DC. I thought Alan was a bit of a weirdo. <laughs> I thought on first meeting that he was a bit of a bastard. On the nights when we were all at home together in a flat in Dundee, John came up with many interesting variations to play on various games, which mostly involved some kind of humiliation for the loser. Um, <laughs> for instance, I remember... Uh, if you lost whatever the game was, you had to go down to the local shop and ask for a tin of mulligatawny soup. And I don't think the guy sold mulligatawny soup for it. Do you remember, John? I think that was the guy. He, he said um, uh, that someone had ordered a whole box of mulligatawny soup and never come back. And he, I don't know why he told me this. <laughs> I thought it would be a good idea to go down and buy a tin of mulligatawny soup. Uh, I remember we used to walk along the road wearing, was it your bearskin coat? My coat and your hats. <laughs> yeah, this is what you had to do in Dundee because DC Thompson's didn't pay you enough money to go out anywhere. Yeah, you couldn't afford to get drunk. You just had to play foolish games. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I loved the, uh, when, when I interviewed John a few years ago, I, I, I loved hearing about uh, life at DC Thompson. And it, it very much sounded like um, the beginning of my career as like a junior reporter on a local newspaper where you were paid absolute crap and expected to, uh, uh, to run around like a blue ass fly doing all the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. Yeah, that sounds about right. But I do have to say, DC Thompson was a very good um, teaching school, at least for me. They taught me nearly everything I know about journalism. Yeah, well, pretty much the same. I wouldn't be in the game if it wasn't for them. But I see it more a wee bit more like the siege of Stalingrad, like you were all thrown together in this sort of artistic poverty and you had to make friends because there was nothing else. Well, it worked. Here we are <laughs> years later and we're still friends. At least I think yeah, we are. Yeah. Are we? <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to talk about was, was about your, uh, uh, I don't want to get all Freudian, but um, about your relative uh, upbringings. So obviously, John, you, 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 uh, came to Scotland when you were, uh, I think, 12 or 13. Um, 
were, were you yeah. would you consider yourselves to be from similar backgrounds you know what 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 were uh was, was it kind of your your standard uh kind of i don't know working class upbringing or or were there, were there differences between you well there must have been differences between us my father was a coal miner and it was pretty standard working class until I was about 13 or 14 when he was promoted to a much better paid job and things changed quite a lot. But up until then, it was a standard Scottish working class uh, affair. Yeah, I think I'd pretty well qualify for that. Uh, I mean, my father was unemployed most of his life. And, and I never saw him after I was 13. And uh, yeah, this, the family I lived with was pretty working class. Uh, certainly uh, developed a deep hatred for Tories. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's something that um, has cropped up in a couple of interviews that you've, that you've both done is, is this um, dislike of authority. And... Um, I think Alan, you, you've you, you referred in a, a book review that you did uh, um, when you look at children's comics, particularly the Beano and the Dandy. You know, the stuff coming out of DC Thompson um, at the time that, that, that you were reading it, um, and the parent was always the the kind of cop of last order. You know, it was the, that's where the buck stopped. That was the person of ultimate authority, and it it always feels reading both both of your work both together and, and independently that there is this deep-seated dislike of bullies and authority and people telling you what to do. Um, I, I just wonder what your thoughts were on, on where, where that came from. Well, in my case, my grandmother was housebound. And when I was four years old, she taught me how to read and write using the Bino and the Dandy as her templates. So by the time I went to primary school, when I was about four and a half, I was the only person in the class who could already read and write. Unfortunately, my granny had taught me to write using my left hand because I was naturally left-handed. So my earliest memories of school were standing out in front of the class every day, every morning, and being belted on my left hand until it curled up and I could no longer use it. So that I was forced to, to write right-handed. Uh, and because it was totally unnatural to me, everything came out backwards. And I got belted further for that because the headmaster said I was doing it deliberately. So that was my dislike of authority established a very early age. Yeah, I can't talk that. Yeah, that, that's a pretty harrowing tale. Yeah, it was horrible. I can't talk. Yeah, I bet, yeah. I, I, I can't uh, isolate anything that particularly made me so uh, un unaccepting of authority, but I was always just a bad boy. <laughs> that, that was my thing you know I was bad through most of my life as Alan said he said when he met me he thought I was horrible and yeah there you go still at it <laughs> it, it, it it always uh, the thing that really strikes me about um, kids comics uh, of that era is that they actually have a really strong moral code in them. You know, the person who you see kids, the characters who start trouble, uh, kind of getting their comeuppance for it. So you know, you think about the characters like Faceache and and uh, and, and um, Dennis the Menace when they when they are particularly bad. You know, they get they get the slipper, they get into trouble. Um, and I, I I wondered how much you thought that might have rubbed off on, on, on you both, particularly if, you know, th these were the first things that, that you were uh, learning to read with, whether that moral code had kind of imbued itself in you. 
Well, it rubbed off on me because the headmaster of our primary school, when he decided that I was writing backwards deliberately, sent for my parents and told them that, and told them that I had to be punished at home as well. So every lunchtime and every tea time, I was forced to do homework. And if I got it wrong by writing the letters backwards, I got belted by my parents from it in the absence of the teacher. So I've always hated people who could belt me. <laughs> well, I, th I think you'd find that most of the stuff that we've written has an ambiguous morality. It's, it's, I don't think it's something that uh, I picked up particularly. It's uh, uh, that kind of model I reject. I always hated parents and you know, you know, the, the slipper and all that, you know. Uh, uh, so, I mean, that's probably why Dredd's uh, such a likable bastard. And, and uh, who else have we done? That's uh, Johnny Alpha. He's got a strange morality too. And uh, it's not your standard DC Thompson Valiant Hotspur model. Well, I, I, li I like that. Uh, that notion that uh, you know the, the the characters you have done ha have been a reaction in, against that in a way you know the, it, it's been you uh, bringing as you say an ambiguous morality to them yeah uh, so they they can be both good but it's it's I guess it's the line about um, a lot of uh, a lot of great characters you know they're not all bad but they're not all good either. No, that pretty, pretty well sums up everybody in the world. Everybody's a bit good and a bit evil. Do you think uh, with with such a strong brand like DC Thompson be, being based in Dundee, was, was this always something that, um, Alan, you had looked to do, to, to be involved in, in journalism, or, or uh, was this something you came to later? Yeah, it was something I came to later, but not that much later. When I left school, um, the headmaster told me he was only giving me one reference because I'd been so badly behaved. And uh, I took a job with one of the, the larger banks. And from day two, I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Um, so I was continually looking for new jobs. And uh, I left the bank. I got a job as an encyclopedia salesman, at which I was crap. Um, I got a job with an insurance company. I hated that as well. And it was just the chance uh, sighting of an advert in the Edinburgh Evening News uh, from DC Thompson looking for new staff that caused me to apply. And they accepted me. I mean, they didn't know what I was like. And more full then, but they accepted me anyway. And uh, what can I say? I've never looked back, or I've never looked back very far. Because I think I think John, you, uh, wasn't it your your aunt who pointed yeah, out? Yeah, when, when we came across uh, from America, we stayed with my aunt and uncle in Greenock, and. Uh, I think after four or five years, they got quite correctly pretty sick of me. Uh, and uh, oh, it was a nice thing of her to do, but she, I was working at a, a printer's in nearby Guruk, a sort of go nowhere job. Um, and she brought an advert from the, um, I think it was the, the Evening Times, I can't remember what the Evening News, uh, in Glasgow for editorial assistance and Ian suggested I uh, try for a job there and having failed at school and no qualifications uh, I thought it was worth a try seemed quite interesting and uh, like Alan I got the job uh, they took a chance on a lot of people who, who uh, others might not have uh, and generally they got quite a lot of good staff out of it um, same yeah, way. I, uh, 
I don't quite know the process he went through. Sorry, Alan, you're going to say something. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is going to stun your listeners. That's <laughs> opening the episode with uh, Alan referring to you as a bastard. I think he's going to carry us through uh, with a lot of our listeners. I think that, 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 that's worth its weight in gold uh, in podcasting terms. Yeah, um, yeah but, but everybody knows I'm the nicest man in comics. <laughs> Yeah, I'd vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, that's that's not me for six for a moment there. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I've 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 spoken to to, to to both of you independently about um, uh, DC Thompson and and the, the the kind of well, I suppose nowadays we think of it as quite an archaic, old fashioned type of of company really wouldn't we the, 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 where it was quite stuck in its ways i guess a lot of uh, a lot of the people they employed went on to greater things uh, a lot of the people they employed went on to lesser things but um a lot of people did well out of it right uh, i used to work for the fiction department so you might go in at nine o'clock in the morning and the boss of the fiction department a guy called George Carr would throw a piece of paper down on your desk saying, uh, write a 2000 word story uh, on this subject, which you more or less had to do. It had nothing to do with work. I guess it was teaching you how to work. So they, they, nothing happened to those stories. It was, it was literally just an exercise yeah, for the staff, good. Nothing happened with the story. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that fills me with horror. <laughs> but I guess, in the, I guess in the long run, it, it, as you say, you know, it, it helped get you in the practice of being able to churn out that number of words in one go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And did, did, were you kind of aware of each other? At work, did you did you cross paths at, at, at DC Thompson um, fairly early on? No, we ended up sharing a flat. Well, I think for the first nine months, it's, uh, we didn't particularly know each other. I got to know you through my flatmate Joe. Yeah, yeah. I remember the first time we got together, we got an, an enormous drunk. We went down to the Bothy. And uh, we started sampling all the optics one by one. And I think you got arrested that day, didn't you? I think so, yes, I did. <laughs> and several occasions afterwards, too. <laughs> oh, I was sick for days. And I don't drink anymore. Happy days. I did read an interview with with uh, Alan, which related to uh, life at IPC a few years later, where um, uh, management had identified you, Alan, as a, a, a quote-unquote troublemaker. And I'm beginning to see <laughs> how, how, how this came about. Yeah, well, the adult world made me a troublemaker, so I just filled the position they had given me. But when I worked for IPC at first, it, was, it wasn't on comics. It was on girls' magazines, like Loving and Love Affair. And all the material that I was writing at that time were true confessions with titles like uh, I Stole to Have an Abortion, and My Boyfriend Was a Hell's Angel. So I was quite a successful writer of true confession stories. <laughs> Mm. What what what's the, what's the, the the secret to a good true confession story? Well, my secret was pretending to be a girl when I was a guy because all, <laughs> all the stories had to be from a girl's point of view. Like, I have never personally stolen to have an abortion, and I, I've never had a boyfriend who was a hell's angel. <coughs> 
That was one of the first jobs we did uh, in fiction department in DC Thompson's was writing the daily horoscopes for uh, The Courier. That's the sort of Dundee daily newspaper. And these, these like 18, 19 year olds putting them together. I was always wanting to say things like, you will die today, <laughs> lucky color blue and stuff like that. Avoid the man with the knife in Sainsbury. <laughs> Stay at home today, do not go out, it is ill-fated for you. Yeah, we had quite a lot of fun with that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't suppose our readers had quite as it's much. It's a good introduction to this one. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm beginning to see where the, the, the kind of dark humour in things like Dread <laughs> comes from. Well, you can put that down to John. Dread was entirely John's and Carlos's, Carlos Esquerra's creation. I was very much a latecomer. But fortunately, my attitude chimed with John's on a great many things. Yeah. So. I, think, I think one good thing about freelance life is that uh, it suits people like us. You know, not, neither of us was really suited to working in an office and having a boss and freelance life was a good way out. It sort of kept me sane, you know, just uh, keeping away from it all and not having to associate with people too much. Yeah, I would agree with that. Wait, kept... I mean, fuck them, Mike, fuck them. <laughs> Wait, funny enough, that brings us nicely onto one question I did want to ask, which was about Cromarty House. <laughs> now, um, I, I may have misheard in in, in um, the the long interview I did with John, but was was the the Cromarty House job a job that you did first, Alan? Uh, yes, I was looking to leave London, looking to get away from it all, and the job of caretaker of Cromarty House was uh, just about as far away from it as you could get. Um, the boss lived 400 miles away, so basically you could do what you wanted. And I quite enjoyed my time there. When, I mean, when you finished, that's when you took a, uh, up the job, wasn't it, John? Once Alan left, yeah. It was 25 acres of nice secluded real estate and uh, lovely views, uh, you know, a very pretty place, Cromarty. So... Uh, there were a lot of advantages to living there. The only disadvantage was that he didn't pay you anything and you were expected to, well, we were both supposed to be freelancing. I know I didn't, not until later on. Yep, same with me. I was on social security. Yeah, a couple of layabouts we were. Yep. <laughs> well, tell me a, a, a bit about, I, I mean, been over it before, but but just in case anyone's not heard those interviews, tell me a bit about how you, how you both came to be down uh, in London uh, working for for IPC because you, you 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 kind of done your time on uh, at DC Thompson, but you both independently came down to to London at different times, didn't you? Yeah, John, you go first. You went down first. Ella. I went. Well, down you went down first. Uh, oh right. Yeah. Um, and I thought I would get a job with the comics division, but they were on strike at the time. So I was snapped up by the female fiction department. That's how I ended up on Loving and Love Affair. Um, I also worked on Honey and a couple of other titles, uh, mainly because it was easy. Mm. And then I came down about a year later and uh, I was working on the comics. I'd been freelancing and uh, working freelance at first in the office and then became the editor of Sandy. <laughs> and meanwhile, Alan, you were heading off north. Yeah, I was going You've had enough. Yeah. Yeah, but I didn't like London very much. 
That was why I deserted it for. In terms of your different experiences of editorial, I, I think, you know, John, um, you, you had uh, bad, bad luck on a, on a few of the, the girl titles that you were that you were put on um, where they didn't last necessarily last very long. But well, you create, you create your own luck, don't you, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that was the way comics work. So, um, uh, you, uh, you wrote a title for a while and watched it gradually decrease in circulation until the point where either you got a boost with free gifts or it got merged into another comic, which is generally what happened. And, uh, the first one I edited, Sandy, it, uh, it lasted a good while. It wasn't a bad comic, but eventually got merged into um, Tammy. And then I took, they moved me out of there before it collapsed and put me on Princess Tina, which I, I genuinely, I genuinely did kill that. I really made a balls up of that. It was going <laughs> to die anyway, but I sure uh, didn't help it along or did help it along. <laughs> I wasn't really a girls comic editor I should never have been in there bastard like me <laughs> <laughs> well, so did, 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 did this uh, did this bastard streak uh, manifest itself did uh, you know what, did the stories get meaner the longer you were on these titles um no, I think they, they started mean and kept on mean. There were some silly ones too. The ones I wrote were more silly than mean. Uh, my mean streak really didn't come out till I started on battle. There was a lot of mean in that. And it's yeah. been mean ever since. But mean with a heart of gold, I want you to know. <laughs> and Alan, you, you, you'd, you'd gone back up to... Uh, well, you went back up to to, to, to Scotland. Um, <coughs> tell us a little bit about where, where you were professionally at this point, because you, you stayed in editorial longer than John did, didn't you? Uh, I can't remember. I know that when I got, went to Cromarty, I left with quite a wide range of work, which I was supposed to do for uh, the girls' magazines, the IPC. But... Uh, that was soon forgotten about when I discovered uh, the joys of spending sunny afternoons with a bottle of vodka. So I spent my time at Cromarty House getting drunk in the afternoon and not doing any of the freelance work which I'd been contracted to do. I thought my time in publishing was probably over by then. Uh, I moved back to Dundee and as the only job I could get, I ended up making, making up puzzles for puzzle magazines. Uh, so I still have a, a particular hatred of puzzle magazines. If, if, you, if you felt, uh, yeah, if, if you had this work and, and you weren't doing it, was, was there any pushback? Were, were there phone calls or letters just saying, Where's the work? Uh, no, not really. I think they expected it of me. There's only one phone in the place anyway. It was upstairs in the big hoots. I was going to say that. We didn't have a phone. I think it was upstairs in the library or something. Yeah. Oh, so we're mixing up Dundee and uh, Cromarty. <laughs> to, there was only one electricity point in in the in the accommodation at Cromarty, so you could only run one or two things like a kettle or a, an electric fire or a, a stereo. You couldn't run too many. Right, there were no electric points in the bedrooms uh, or in the bathroom. There was no heating in the bathroom. Uh, the only heating was a a little wood burning Rayburn. Yep, yep. 
You see, you, you were making this sound incredibly idyllic until you said there was no heating in the bathroom. No, uh, well, we were, it's rough edge. We were young, it didn't matter that much. <laughs> so no, I, 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 I kind of want to uh, skip forward a little bit because um, uh, John, you did you you worked on on uh, battle, and then obviously there was action in in two thousand AD. Um, Alan, were you kind of what what was your impressions of what was going on at the time uh, with, uh, with with the comic scene? You know, were you how much were you keeping abreast of things like battle? I was I wasn't keeping abreast of it at all. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I was doing. You were on the buses. Oh yeah, yeah. That was in Dundee, though. I was a bus conductor in Dundee. Yeah. So that what happened was, uh, well, Alan was up in Dundee, and he was, uh, you know, he seemed to have wasted all that talent. So uh, I suggested he write some complete stories for 2000 AD. Remember. Uh, Yep. Uh, God, what were they? What were they called? Oh, uh, I remember the anyway. character Dorian and Norma. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I went down to London for an interview with the guy who made up the comics, uh, the puzzle comics. And when I was down there, John suggested that I should go along and introduce myself to the editor of 2000 AD who at that time was Kelvin Gosnell. So I did that, and by the time I'd had finished the interview, I had a new job on 2000 AD as a sub-editor. So that was how I got into comics. And thankfully, I could forget about puzzles after that. Do you want to talk a little bit about what the, the role of a sub-editor on a comic book was? Because it, it was a, a pretty small team. So I think it was, it was Kelvin, yourself. Was, was Kevin O'Neill still there at that point? Uh, no, I think Kevin had he left shortly after I joined and he was replaced by Robin Smith. But yes, it was it was small teams. Um, small teams who weren't particularly friendly with each other. When Kelvin moved on to become editor of Tornado, uh, Steve McManus took over on 2000 AD. You know what was what was your kind of day to day work? Was it all kind of script stuff? Was it um, proofing? Uh, you know what what was the kind of division of everything that a sub editor does? It was rewriting other people's scripts, um, figuring out what features were going to go into the comic. Uh, I had a say on what the cover would be or what stories we were running a story of the week. Uh, Steve and I did that kind of thing together. But I can't say that working editorially was perfect for me because it wasn't. And it wasn't until I went freelance myself that I found out what was perfect for me. You got a pretty good reputation for responding to submissions from people. When I arrived at 2000 AD, they had, I can't remember how many it was, but like five or six big filing cupboards, which were totally stuffed with letters from the fans, with uh, material which some people had written and it had just disappeared and never heard of it again. So I took it upon myself to answer these five or six filing cabinets stuffed with material. And I quite enjoyed doing it. And there are probably several people got a start in comics who might otherwise not have. When you were working in editor, when you were being sub editor on, on 2000 AD, what was your impression of of what the comic was, of 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 what it was doing, because obviously you know after that initial burst of 
energy uh, from Pat when when he set it up. It then moved on to Kelvin and then uh, Steve McManus. What was your uh, yeah impressions at the time? Uh, how did you feel about the kind of stuff that, that the, the comic was putting out? Was it was it basically what what you enjoyed uh, seeing? Yeah, I enjoyed most of what I was working on. Um, some of it required a lot more work than other stuff did, but well, basically, I learned to write by rewriting other people's material. I won't mention any names. <laughs> when when uh, explain the, uh, uh, your decision to go uh, freelance because obviously you know you you, you as you said. Uh, editorial wasn't really what you wanted to do. I can't remember what made me go freelance this, the second time. Uh, oh, you maybe, go and work for Stuart Will, don't you? <laughs> well, it was when you were living at Jeffrey's farm, John. That's and right, I, yeah. I moved in with you. And I saw what, what a quite nice life freelancers had compared with the editorial staff, because I had to travel up and down to London at 90 minutes a journey. Right, yeah. And John didn't have to do that. So I think I think John actually asked me to start helping him out with a couple of stories. He was ill at the time and he was afraid he wouldn't make his deadlines. So I started out as a co-writer with John and uh, John taught me the rest of all I knew in, in comics. Tell us a bit about this life on this um, in this farmhouse because uh, again, this sounds quite idyllic. Yeah, it certainly was. We played a lot of frisbee. <laughs> yeah, we had a course around the garden and we'd take breaks playing frisbee, you know, this is, put it around obstacles through swings. So I certainly yeah. wasn't expecting to find out that you both did kind of ultimate frisbee in, in, uh, in, in, your, in your break times. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and after I moved out of the farm, you moved in. That's right, yeah. You moved to Colchester, I think. Yeah. And I moved into the farm. And that's when I had to start taking writing seriously. I didn't have anybody like John to protect me anymore. The image that I've got from, from interviews that I've read with you both of uh, when you were working together, um, it, it seems like uh, two people who don't really uh, like offices or necessarily um, working with others suddenly found that, that you know, that something clicked. You were able to spend that time in each other's presence and talk to each other. Um, mm -hmm. It was, was this something you both fell into or, or was it, uh, right, well, if we're going to write this stuff, we need to, to be in the same space? No, I think we pretty much fell into it. I don't remember ever sitting down and talking seriously about it. No, well, there's so much uh, you can benefit from working together. It's something that I'd had experience of working with Pat. I mean, there are strange, but there are great benefits. So I was pretty sure with Alan, who uh, we, we got on well anyway with Alan, uh, that we, we would form a pretty good team. And it, it lasted quite a long while, I think. Yeah, about 10 years. Yeah, we used to spend the first two or three hours just jawing, talking about this and that, before we finally forced ourselves to get down to work. Which is, you know, it, it makes uh, it makes working life a lot more pleasant. Yep, yep. But the, the, you mentioned before about um, sort of combing the papers for stories, and I, I guess that's something that, that 
particularly true with with things like dread where uh it's quite clear that something that happened in the real world about you know four or five six months later there's a a judge dread story which is kind of riffing off it yep yep we did that quite a lot yeah it was really useful just appellate I guess was it also really productive really productive because I mean you look at some like uh, prog 476 and and you know once you kind of pick apart the pseudonyms that you both uh, <laughs> worked under um there's five stories you know you you were writing five stories in one issue I mean that's a, a hell of a pace of work we had to do something after we've written eagle <laughs> what stories were they what in 476 yeah ace trucking the garpit baggers uh, Judge Anderson, The Possessed, Bad City Blue, uh, Judge Dredd, obviously, Paid With Thanks, uh, and Strontium Good Dog heavens. Rage, all, all in wow. one issue. Well, remember also, John, we were working for other IPC comics. Yeah. Uh, we were working for uh, Eagle and Scream. Yeah. Where did all it, the money go? <laughs> well, in those days, you didn't get any share of the royalties. Neither of us was on any percentage for anything. So the only way to make money was to write more material. Um, and the only reason we used as many nom de plumes as we did was because the managing director of IPC, John Sanders, didn't want the readers to know it was the same two guys who were writing nearly everything he published. I think that was probably only a short period in the life of the comics, though, you know, for a couple, you know, a year, two years where we wrote so much. Yeah. But maybe I'm wrong. No, but... <clears throat> it was a really kind of concentrated around that, that kind of mid, mid-80s, sort of, you know, 84, 85, 86. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess my question is, why do you think it worked? What was beyond? You know, you're obviously friends. You'd obviously known each other. Why do you think you you? What qualities were there that that, that made it easy for you to, to to work together at such a an absolute pace? We had a very similar sense of humour. I mean, I guess I guess that helps. Yeah, quite a good work. any working relationship, really, doesn't it? Yeah, we had quite a good working arrangement too. It's, uh, you know, we, we, when we wrote a story together, it wasn't all perfect, but whoever typed it up sorted it out as they typed it. And whoever typed it up got the money. It was it was quite well organised. It's yeah. quite interesting. We had everything written down. In the book. Uh, you know, we taught up each week who you know, who'd written what, who, you know, who'd earned what, and then carried over into the next week. It was quite interesting to look back on the book and see all this, all the stuff we wrote and did. We were busy. Yeah, we certainly were. <laughs> was there much in the way of planning? Because I, I know, John, you've, you've, you've said before that, you know, you, 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 <sighs> You don't necessarily know where the story is going when you when you start it, and you prefer it that way. Um, no, no. Was it a case of, of as you know, as you were writing, both writing stuff? Was that the way that you, that you did it? It was certainly the way that I did it, and it's still the way I write stories now. I start them yeah. off not how they're going to finish. Yeah, I just realised this month that. I write stories as I, when I do that. I start them off, not usually not knowing where they go, but about halfway through, I've got to figure out the ending so I actually know where they go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there is a sort of sense to it all. Like the one I, I wrote today, I've got no idea how it's going to end. Uh, probably at the end of next episode, I'll have to figure that out. But it leaves you free to experiment a bit more to follow leads that you never imagined were going to be there to uh, 
like characters and events direct the story in different ways. Uh, you know, if everything, it's like I probably said to you before, if everything is down sort of in concrete, then the story gets boring and uh, lacks imagination and adventure, or it can do. Denny O'Neill, the editor of Batman, was horrified to find out that I, that I worked that way. Uh, he sat and worked everything out in meticulous detail before he started writing the story. Whereas I just wrote down a load of ideas <laughs> and then started writing it. One of the things I was quite intrigued uh, in an interview uh, that one of you did was uh, the notion that, that you tended to write comedy later in the day or, or in, in, in the evenings. Um, you know, once you kind of got serious work, quote unquote, out of the way. Do, do, do you have any recollection of that? Is that was that something that uh, kind of stood out? I don't remember. No, nor do I. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the end of that one then. Um, OK. <laughs> well, what, what, what happened? It wasn't that. It was that once we split up, once Alan went on to Batman and I went took over Dread, we still worked together in the evenings. So whatever story we were doing together, like um, Judgment on Gotham, or the Batman Dread team-ups, the Bogeyman, um, the Lobo, was it Lobo Dread? Lobo Dread. Uh, Bob the Bum, you know, all, all that stuff. We worked on it in the evening together. So, and a lot of it happened to be humorous. Yeah. It's a lot easier on yourself late at night. And one of the things I wanted to ask about was um, the 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 notion of dread and and perhaps your differing ideas about the character. Because I noticed when when um, uh, after Alan uh, comes into the uh, you know the partnership. Um, there does seem to be more of this anti-authoritarianism coming through. You know, it becomes much stronger. Um, and I wondered about your, your different opinions on uh, how you viewed Dread at that point in time. We viewed him as Margaret Thatcher wearing a uniform. Thatcher was the prime minister at the time. And she was a right wing nut case. And I guess, I mean, Dredd had always been pretty right wing, but we just continued to make him more so. Although I wouldn't say it was a nut case. <laughs> uh, uh, it's probably just our, our politics began, uh, the two of us together, you know, we just kept to. Uh, feeding off itself and uh, making, it's always nice to bring Dread back to basics and make him really right wing when doing some really nasty stuff. Uh, and that, I guess that appealed to both of us. It was, a, it could be an off, uh, the early Dreads could often be, uh, especially ones I worked on could often be quite silly and uh, gradually that sort of thing, uh, played up less in dread than the serious stuff and the political stuff and uh, social comment. It was a gradual evolution. Because one thing I, I did want to, to talk about was, uh, was Chopper, um, who, I, I, I must admit, when, when, when I was reading this stuff originally when I was, when I was younger, I, I was never a big fan of, of Chopper necessarily. But as I've revisited the stuff, it, it, it he stood out more and more as a character who is different to every other opponent Dredd has faced. In that he's just a kid, you know. You you you, you have him being a graffiti artist, and then you know a, a, um, somebody who just wants to uh, break free. Um, was this was Chopper a, a, a character? Do you recall that? came out of a, re a reaction to Dread, or would, do, you, do you recall if it was inspired by uh, something in particular? 
I don't we recall. Got, we got a letter from a kid in Glasgow, I think, and it was. Can't remember what he said, but he signed himself Chopper. And we liked the the cut of his jib, so we uh, used him as a carrier. I don't know if it had any, what actually happened in Chopper's life had any relation to the kid, but uh, that's how the name came. And was, yeah. was, there, was there anything in, in, in Chopper that, uh, I guess, <laughs> because cause he feels like a very 80s character, you know, a, a, a somebody who uh, doesn't have a lot of prospects, just wants to be free, wants to break away. Um, is is there anything of you both in Chopper? And I'm particularly thinking because, you know, you, you look at a character like um, uh, Anarchy, which Alan, you wrote for, for, for Batman, and it feels like there's yeah, continuity. There. Anarchy was definitely inspired by Chopper. And he's been very successful. But no, I grew to really like Chopper. Uh, and I think the only time that I remember John and I falling out about a story at that time was the end of the Chopper and Oz story. When Dredd stood and let Chopper go free, I argued that Dredd should shoot him in the back and finish him off, but John said no. So, I mean, John proved to be right. Uh, shooting Chopper in the back might have been might have been good for Dread, but I don't think it would have been good for the comic series as a whole. Yeah, we had a bad habit, didn't we, of killing off characters who might have a lot of mileage still left in them. Yep, yep. <laughs> Which is one of the things that made 2000 AD good. You never knew if your, if your hero was going to get the chop violently. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think I read an interview where, um, uh, just picking up on the whole disagreement thing, uh, well, I think it was Alan said that there were never any arguments until we started working on serious stories. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd love to know why you think it was it was that that introduced um disagreements was 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 it because you were coming from slightly different angles on on this kind of stuff no i think it was because john knew the comics medium better than i did and he instinctively knew what was the right thing to do i would quite often have made a number of bad decisions if it hadn't been for john keeping me on the straight and narrow uh, um I thought, well, I'm not sure that's totally true. I always felt that, you know, your way and my way were probably equally good with the story. They would have worked equally well if we had differences on a serious story. It's just really difficult. Uh, like comedy is easy. Comedy, you feed off each other. Even action, action, you, you feed off each other. But something with a strong emotional content is a very personal and subjective thing. Yeah. And it's necessarily right, but it's difficult for you to compromise. I, I agree with that. One of, the, one of the things I, I, I love about Dread is... Um, <coughs> that uh, the the democracy storyline, which you know uh, everyone always talks about, um, you know, from from letter from a Democrat all the way through uh, to to the latest stuff. Um, the uh, the um, the terrorist group who take over the uh, uh, TV station in in Letter from a Democrat were originally meant to be the Baffin Island Nudist Liberation Front. That's true. And I, 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 I love the idea that, you know, it, it, what is generally taken to be quite, you know, a serious and, and uh, kind of hard hitting series could well have been very different if you decided to go with that. Yeah, it could well have been. I think that was probably John's decision as well uh, to make it into the democracy movement because it, uh, it gave the story. It gave the story a real deep background, which could be felt 
by many of the readers who were aware that they were living in a right-wing society. I wanted to talk a, a, a little bit about politics because there, there was an interview I read where, um, I don't know whether you, you were winding the interviewer up or not, uh, Alan, but you, you, you described you both as uh, right-wing with left-wing tendencies. <laughs> well, I speak as someone who was thrown out of the Young Conservatives for being uh, too labour-minded. And I was thrown out of the Young Socialist Party for being too conservative-minded. Yeah, I think that basically what both parties were saying was that I was just too argumentative for either of them. And in, 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 in terms of where you were both coming from at this time, it, 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 with something like Dredd, where, who is such a, um, as you say, he's a bastard, he, he, he's, he's very hardline. And then you've got a character like Strontium, uh, well, like uh, Johnny Alpha. Um, was, was that a contrast to right? Were, were, were you uh, deploying different strengths uh, when you were writing the different characters or, or were both just a product of this partnership, do you think? That's a hard one. What do you think, uh, John? They, they were contrasting characters. Uh, uh, Johnny sort of slipped off the tongue a bit easier, didn't he? He was uh, an easier character to come to grips with than Dread. Yeah. Uh, but in, in a way, they were both sort of a bit uptight about things. Dread in a different way, authoritarianism, and Johnny... Uh, just turned in on himself because of his childhood yeah, and his yeah. uh, prejudice of uh, norms. I'm interested in the dynamics of your writing partnership. Um, in you know, you, you you had the mechanisms that you went through where you know, one you you talk through a story and one of you would type it up, and but it it I'm interested in the kind of what you thought at the time, you know, was it just make hay while the sun shines, this is working, let's just keep going? Or was there a plan? Did you did you have an idea of where you wanted to go with this writing partnership, uh, that it might have an end? Well, when I suggested that uh, Alan join me, I felt I was running out of ideas. And uh, having Alan working with me sort of uh, put water back in the well, as it were, you know, there was a, a lot more ideas running through the stories. And in a way, especially the Strontium Dog, I felt a lot more direction to the story and a lot more soul to it um, by having Alan's input. And so that the the partnership seemed to, to both of us, I think, to work very well. Uh, it was only everything in the end goes stale. You know, I don't know what it was. You just sometimes need a change. Yep. Uh, yep. I would say we lasted nearly 10 years. Yep. So it worked pretty well. The the kind of late 80s were quite a key period because you 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 um brought the the writing partnership to a to a close though it was a lot uh, quite often I've, the way people have presented it makes it sound like there was an argument but um because you 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 continued working together even after you stopped working together on 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 dread and, and strontium dog um with things like um outcasts and uh the last american um it felt like you you, you were finally not finally you were getting to projects that that um you felt perhaps appeal to your strengths you know particularly with something like uh the the the, the last american you know it, it feels very much like a story that you both wanted to to tell. Um, did you have that feeling at the time that, that that you were you know finally getting to 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 have your voice and and put stories out there that were that were yours and that you were happy to have uh, created together? Well, for my part, definitely yes. Although that's not to say that I was unhappy with any of the work which John and I had done together before. And I think it stood up then and it still stands up now. 
Yeah, it's, it's good to create things. I mean, I'm not happy working on other people's material or seldom happy. And uh, there's a sense of achievement when you can create a whole story from nothing. Uh, and uh, we did have some ambitions as well to uh, do a lot more work in the American market, which Alan, you achieved. Uh, but um, uh, whew, uh, uh, lost the thread. Uh, you just weren't into American comics the way I was. Uh, no, I never was. Uh, and uh, I didn't like a lot of the things, I didn't like a lot of them. Whereas yeah. I liked uh, British comics a lot. I would agree with that. There was a lot about American comics I didn't like. But I had been a, I don't know what you call them, Marvel fan. How many years? How many? How many years were you on Detective with Norm? Uh, ten years. Yeah, ten. yeah, that was a really good partnership. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's not often you get to work with an artist who you feel can read your mind, but I felt that Norm could see through what I was writing to what was at the base of it. And he illustrated it as such. And I think really the only other person who's done that with me is Arthur Ransom on the Judge Anderson stories. And it makes a big difference when you feel that you're, that you're in mind contact with your artist. John, is, is that something you, that you felt with, for example, somebody like Carlos? Um. Yeah, I'm not sure it was quite the same. I, I just uh, always knew that uh, whatever I did, Carlos would make a good job of it. So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know that. Well, yeah, probably. Um, there's, I've always felt that with Cam Kennedy, in a way, that uh, uh, Cam was just brought things to our stories that... Uh, perfectly illustrated what was going on in them and, and always brought out the humor of them. So uh, I think we had a really good uh, link with him, but I've never thought of it any, as anything more than the just Carlos, brilliant artist. One thing I wanted to ask about was um, the Judge Dredd magazine, because uh, it celebrated its anniversary uh, last year and, uh, sorry, this year, uh, and that that is something that, that does mark a kind of fundamental change, uh, not just the fact that 2008 got its um, sister comic for the first time, but also uh, a move to acknowledge and uh, explore Dread's world as uh, a, a slightly more mature, uh, slightly more adult um, style of telling stories. Um, what was were, were you both keen for, for example, Dread to to get his own spin off comic? Was it something that that you felt would would work? Yeah, I th I thought that it was right for it was the right time, and I think the fact that the magazine is still going uh, stands as some kind of testimony to that feeling. It's amazing the number of other stories that Dread's World has spun off as well. And I think the magazine gave people license to do that, to take it in other directions. And 2000 AD seems to be, uh, do that a lot these days as well. But the number of stories that are spun off from Dread or Mega City One or Dread's World was amazing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, when you were putting the magazine together, John, um, yeah. was was this kind of a reminder why you'd left uh, editorial in the first place? <laughs> uh, well, it became that way. Yeah, I mean, it, it is such a hard, bloody job. Uh, uh, 
you, you could spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week on it and still never get a magazine the way you want it. Uh, so it's why I have so much admiration for people like Matt Smith who can keep the show on the road for so long, working so well. Uh, it was just too bloody difficult. Uh, um, it was fun to do in many ways to fill uh, to fill a magazine with stuff you liked, but you know when things didn't work out, it was, it was a real pain. Like uh, that the uh, the center spreads we tried for the first four issues, they were a hell of a lot of work, and I never thought they they quite worked. They quite came off. You know, maybe if we got the guys from Viz to do them, they would work better. They had they had just the right sort of a sense of humor and sensibility. Uh, but I didn't think uh, the people that were doing them quite got the hang of dread in his world. So that was a disappointment. Um, there were others, but uh, it's uh, editing a book is too much work. It's far easier to concentrate on your own little world. That's what makes freelance such a joy. In terms of where you were economically, uh, the magazine, I believe, uh, involved a, a degree of profit share. But this was around the time that um, uh, things like Toxic were happening and, and uh, you know, that there, there was certainly pressure from, uh, I believe, both of you for greater, uh, greater slice of the pie. Um, looking back on that period now... It, what are your feelings about how um, companies like IPC talked to you, treated you um, as regards things like profit share, things like royalties, uh, things like uh, ownership? Well, who do you want? Well, let, let's, let's, let's go with you first then, John. Well, uh, I have big objections to the way it used to be, but I think that... Uh, after the deal, it's hard to imagine a, a, a much fairer, uh, up to a point, there, there are still some problems with it, but it, it seems a, a, a fairly good uh, way of, uh, well, it works in two ways, that uh, Rebellion will buy uh, create our own material. Certainly they have been from me, which is great. That's just what I want. You know, sell things like Button Man to Hollywood and uh, one day eventually it may even get made. And so that, that's great. And the royalty deal on um, stuff that we created but sold to IPC and now Rebellion own is, is compensation at least I mean, it'd be nice to have the rights on Dread back, but that's never going to happen. Um, but at least to me, Rebellion seemed to be being quite fair and honest about rewarding you for reprint and uh, licensing and merchandising. So I don't have a big objection to it, especially as it seems to me Rebellion of... Uh, uh, really put themselves out there, keeping 2000 AD and the magazine going. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I Are agree. Are we still here? Yep, I'm still here. And I agree. I guess, because I'm, I'm conscious of how long we've been chatting. Um, I guess one thing I, I, I wanted to ask about, I mean, there's so many things I could ask about, but um, was your... Uh, feelings now as regards your creative partnership all that time working together you know not just the, the 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 time that you were sat on the floor with the paper spread out in front of you but uh but beyond what your uh memories feelings are of of that now well i remember it with a lot of fondness with a lot of pleasure i really enjoyed myself and if I'm truthful, I've got to say it's down to John to thank for me becoming a writer. Yeah, I, I miss it. It's a pity it, it couldn't have continued in the evenings, at least. I mean, uh, if I have one regret, it's that we, uh, it was 
so difficult doing the the last bogeyman story living so far apart and i wish we could have done a better job on it uh, uh that's uh, if i have one regret and that that's really it you know uh otherwise i'm really pleased with most of the stuff we turned out and i think it was a good relationship and like alan says fond memories Play the Coronation Street theme now and fade yeah. out. <laughs>